for years I heard this, I still hear it sometimes, your product is the hero. And my thing was always, no, it's not. Nobody, nobody cares about your products. They care about themselves. And so your product is a tool that enables them to feel like a hero. Hi, I'm Aaron Walter. And I'm Eli Woolery. Management is a job, whereas leadership is a quality you have to earn, as we learned way back in episode 21 from our guest, Julie Zhu. Today, we're diving deeper into the topic of leadership with Donna Li Xiao, author of the new book, The Leader's Journey, Transforming Your Leadership to Achieve the Extraordinary. Donna is also the author of The User's Journey, Story Mapping Products That People Love. We chat with Donna about why leadership often gets conflated with management, how to find your own narrative, and why your product isn't the hero. One more thing before we get to the show. Our newsletter this month is going to feature a new column by Margaret Lee, who's a friend of the show. She founded the UX Community and Culture Program at Google in their global user experience organization. And she is now an executive and leadership coach. If you're looking for solid leadership advice from someone who's been in the trenches, you need to check this out. You can subscribe at designbetterpodcast.com so you get the newsletter when it comes out later this month. That's designbetterpodcast.com. Thanks for subscribing and for listening. With Freehand by Envision, we've built a best-in-class visual collaboration platform used by thousands of enterprise customers, inclusively priced for the whole organization at 50% the cost of Miro and Mural, and now with the Intelligent Canvas, allowing teams to maximize their impact by adding intelligence, automation, and connection to the canvas. Try Freehand by Envision today for free at freehandapp.com. This episode is brought to you by Fable, who make it easy to build accessible, inclusive products. Learn more at makeitfable.com and later on in the show. Donna Lichau, welcome to the Design Better podcast. Thanks, Eli. It's good to be here. Well, we're really glad to have you. You got a new book out, which is exciting. We were going to dive into that. Before we do, though, let's rewind a little bit to the beginnings of your career. It looks like you have an MFA in radio, TV, and film. Tell us about that and what kind of set you off on a different career trajectory. I do. I actually have two film degrees, undergraduate and graduate. And I think what you know, set me off in that direction was going to college when I was younger and meeting someone who ended up becoming a mentor years later, who was, I think, 10 years my senior. And I remember her saying, you know, have fun in college, study whatever you want. Don't expect to get a job in it after you're done and enjoy it. Just expand your brain. And after she said that, I thought, you know, originally I was going to study math and psychology and I figured maybe I'll become a therapist or a, I don't know, a math person, whatever you do with math. But yeah, I, I fell in love with film and <laughs> ended up doing that instead. But I always worked at the time, this was in the 90s, as a web designer on the side. That was my side hustle in my college part-time job, building websites. And so I always figured I would work in tech, but film was really fun to study. And then I did it again for some reason <laughs> years <laughs> later. All right, so you spent some time in tech, and you wrote another earlier book, uh, The User's Journey, Story Mapping Products People Love. What brought about that book? You know, it's funny. I, at that point, had been working in tech for maybe 15 years, eventually on the product side of things, building software apps, web apps. And what I found is that when I was working with teams and companies, especially startups who were still figuring out their product market fit, I would come in, things would be completely ill-defined, confusing. And as the head of product, that would be exciting because I get to you know fix things and make them better. But I found myself often saying, what's the story here? And stories also you know, were something that a lot of tech people were obsessed with this was, I guess, 10, 15 years ago, you know, we have, and still are obsessed with, we had agile user stories and journey maps and all these other things that, you know, storyboards. And 
for me as a filmmaker, you know, my question was, okay, yes, that's great, but what is the story? Story to me had architecture, had plot points, had characters, heroes, antagonists, and all these other things. And so I started working in product as I did work years ago as a filmmaker and just started thinking about it all deliberately. And after a few years of that, the teams I worked with loved it so much and companies I collaborated with loved it so much that I ended up turning it into the focus of my entire business and eventually consultancy, which was helping and is what the user's journey in my book was about as well, helping businesses see the story that their users and customers could have when they think about and use their products and how to build the most engaging products out there that don't convert people, it transforms them into heroes. So yeah, that's the closest I've come to working professionally in the film industry, I would say. Actually, I've worked in the film industry, but yeah, that's <laughs> it sort of was a chance to marry my film background and product background. It's fascinating how our career, you know, kind of goes in unexpected directions. You, you studied radio, TV, and film, so very media focused, but it all resolves back to storytelling one way or another there. And then that becomes very applicable in the work that you have done over your career. How do you go about discovering like what you're saying about turning your customer into the hero? How do you go through the discovery process to find that story and extract that out so everyone can understand it? Well, for understanding how customers can be heroes, the good news is that the way you go about doing it, it's just good product discovery practice or a good user-centered design or a good whatever we want to call it. The names change constantly, but you have to understand what your customers want to do need to do, what their needs, goals, dreams, desires are, what obstacles are in their way, what they need to do to achieve their goals and their dreams. And ideally, if you build your products right, they use your product to meet their goals. And so I think in the product world, for years I heard this, I still hear it sometimes, you're product is the hero. And my thing was always, no, it's not. Nobody, nobody cares about your products. They care about themselves. And so your product is a tool that enables them to feel like a hero. When you get that right, you not only hear it from your customers, you could do it during discovery ahead of time. You can do it during the product development process as you're ideating and coming up with flows and features and how things can work. And you hear it from your customers when you start testing things in the wild with them. They'll often echo the narrative arcs and the stories that you build into your products for you. You see it everywhere. You have to just always be listening to your customers and you'll see it and hear it. I'd like to go deeper on this a little bit. So the idea of a hero is sort of an elevated concept. It's not just these are the tasks. This is you know task flow that a person goes through, but it's that they go through this task flow because they have some specific objective, like a noble objective that they want to complete. How do you identify that noble objective in the research process and then identify like, okay, this is the moment in the product where we really can make this thing shine and make that person successful? So there are a bunch of ways to do this, but usually most companies I've worked with at the point that they're launching products or features, they have an inkling of an idea of something. So I'll use the iPhone as an example, just because it's ubiquitous and everyone can reference it in their minds. So if you think about the original iPhone, it didn't start with any big lofty story of any kind. It was Steve Jobs hearing about tablets, wondering about capacitive screen technology, and asking Apple's engineers to play with it and see what they could come up with. And the only story at the time was Steve wants a way to check email on the toilet. Here you go. And, <laughs> and so seriously, originally, was that, is that? Oh yeah. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, very true. Very true. So, you know, they played around. It was supposed to be a tablet and eventually the iPhone became a thing with the technology that they were playing with. So that they tinkered and that's okay. But 
when you look at Steve Jobs' entire career and entire trajectory before Apple, with Apple, in between Apple, and then and then back at Apple, there was always something driving him throughout. And it's bigger than just play with the screen or check email on the toilet. And he was savvy enough to see once they did prototype the iPhone as a proof of concept, something that could change the world. What he saw is this wasn't just a way to check email on the toilet. It wasn't a phone that plays music, which is what it very well could have been. And other companies were producing smartphones that played music. But what he saw this as is a way to communicate with the world around you, a way to change the way we communicate and it would work like magic. The way you come up with something like that, you know, you could say, oh, he was a genius and what I'm not in part of the cult of Steve Jobs as, as a genius. You might just happen to know what the story is for anything you're developing naturally. And that's great. And for the rest of us, you put your design thinking hat on and you ask yourself, all right, why do we need to make phone calls on the go? Why do we need to access music on the go? Why do I want to check email on, on the toilet? And you know, I like thinking of it like the five whys. So you ask why enough times, you'll eventually get down to the deep human need behind anything that we build. And it's typically stuff like food, shelter, love, connection, communication is one of them. And so that's what the iPhone was. That's why it came out initially lacking basic features that every smartphone on the market had, like cut and paste and undo, but those weren't magic and they weren't necessary for you to communicate with the world around you. Other things were you know, it can start from anywhere. I think the biggest thing is that you're always asking yourself, what's the story? What's the story? And making sure it's a good one. Donna, let's maybe get to the point where you pivot your career and you tell the story in the beginning of your new book, The Leader's Journey, about going to a, a workshop, to lead a workshop in Napa. And you come to a realization that what you really need to work on if you're dealing with leaders and leadership is not so much maybe the product itself, but the people but maybe you could dive a little deeper into how you came to that realization. Yeah, so what you're talking about was I guess it was it was my pivotal moment or my turning point in my story when I had a successful consultancy. I was working with some of the most amazing companies in the world and senior leaders at these companies helping them understand the stories that their customers could have with their products and services and how to turn those customers into heroes so that internal leaders could be more effective. And that was what I would come into companies and do eventually. I would shifted a little bit from product development to working with leaders who built products, but wanted to have more influence and be more inspirational at their companies, and ultimately to do a better job leading their teams and their businesses forward. And what I would find is I would come in and it, it definitely hit me at this one offsite with this one executive team. I'd come in, we would talk about what you think of as traditional storytelling, like, all right, uh, what I just told you about the iPhone, you know, let's say you're working at a company and you're developing a product. How do you think of it in that way that Steve Jobs might've done naturally, or he might've done it deliberately? I'm not, you know, can't really say, but how do you think like that? And then how do you act like that around your company with the story? Not acting like Steve Jobs in the other ways that he acted, unfortunately, but how do you get people excited about what you're building? And it was this one team I was working with in Napa that straight up just pulled me aside over lunch one day and said, you know what? This is not our problem. I don't think we need storytelling. <laughs> you know, I don't see how this is going to help me. And I appreciate that they did this. They were very blunt. I love, I still work with this company. A lot, a lot of folks there are very, very blunt and I love it. You know, one of the executives just straight up and said, I don't, our customers are fine. They're not going anywhere, but I don't feel like a hero. How do I feel like a hero? Because if I can't feel like a hero doing my job, I can't do this job right now. 
And what he, um, you know, eventually told me was that people were fighting and the head of engineering and the head of product, they didn't get along and team morale was low and, you know, they were never sure what they were working on half the time. And it was just like, it was things that to me didn't feel like product problems. They felt more like people problems on the one hand. On the other hand, it was abundantly clear that skills would not fix this. And a lot of times in leadership development, you focus on skills. So, okay, these executives, they lack skills. Let's teach them skills. They'll be better leaders. But there were no straight up skills that were going to help these folks. It was something else. And this one executive and the others who came up to me that day, but especially this one just got me thinking at the time, like, how do you be a hero? And and do you need to feel like a hero as a leader in the first place? Because my initial reaction to him was honestly was, this is not about you, get over it. <laughs> you need to turn everyone else into heroes. You know, the world doesn't center around you. How about your team? How about your customers? How about your goals? Like, just get over it. Turn everyone else into heroes in, around your organization and you'll be happy. And I left that day and just thinking, oh my God, that's not right. <laughs> like, I think he does have to feel good to lead his organization forward. Otherwise the whole thing breaks. That was my, my moment where I basically have spent the last seven years figuring this out. Well, not figuring. I spent a couple of years figuring it out now, um, over seven years really focusing on this. And the answer is you can be a hero if you want to be a great leader and you have to feel like a hero. Otherwise it does break. And luckily the answer is still a story, but it's not about the stories you tell. No one cares about the stories you tell. So if it's not skills that help leaders figure stuff out, and I, I agree with you because all of this stuff does boil down to people issues. Like got a whole bunch of people working on a product. The more people you have, more people, more problems. You know, it's like it just gets more complicated, right? What is it? Like a value system that makes a leader a hero that they can operate and feel good about what they're doing? What is it if it's not skills? That's a part of it. And you know, skills matter, but to use you know product terminology, I'm still a product person at heart. So skills matter, but they're not the must-have in this system. They're a nice to have and they make things better. But here's how value systems are a part of it. And the way the way that I think about it and that my clients think about it is this. It's inspired by that one executive's question, but it's also I've spent years researching neuroscience psychology and a whole host of other things as well. Somatic therapy, which involves the body. And what it comes down to is if you want to lead yourself and others forward, you don't have to just feel like a hero. You need to feel and act and think like a superhero. And it's a metaphor on the one hand, which I'll, I'll talk in a second about what superheroes have, because part of that is a value system. It's a metaphor on the one hand, but there's so much psychology and neuroscience behind it. Because if you really unpack any superhero tale ever, it, ultimately they're all about being human. And they're all about finding your place in the world and making an impact in the world. So superhero stories are an amazing metaphor for what it means to be human and make an impact. And if you think about leadership as a superhero or a superhero story, which the two are intertwined. You can't really separate a superhero from their story. What you need to be successful is one, an identity. So that's clear understanding of who you are. And you need to understand your superpowers. So those are the things that you excel at. It could be some skills. It could be other things as well. Quirks. It could be ways that you show up. It could be your values, things that are important to you, superpowers or anything that power you and that make an impact in the world. And you need to be clear on your mission. And that's simply where you're going and the impact that you want to achieve in the world. And when you smash that all together, you're not just clear on who you are, where you're going, how, why, how not, and with whom, because you also need super friends added to that as well. But you can figure out ultimately how you can have the most impact, 
how you can connect with everyone you work with, how you can create super teams and ultimately create businesses that do what they're supposed to do, which is turn their customers into heroes. But when you think about leadership, it really does start with you. You have to figure out who you are, where you're going, with whom, why, how, how not, in no particular order. Once you figure that out, you go make things happen and you turn everyone you work with into superheroes and it's magic. We'll return to the conversation after this quick break. Methodical crafts coffee and tea for people of all kinds. They've been around and roasting for more than eight years, and they are certified coffee nerds. On their site, you'll find useful brewing guides that'll teach you how to turn your coffee brewing chore into a beloved ritual and really dial in that perfect cup. I'm a longtime subscriber to the Roaster's Choice subscription and start every day with a cup of methodical coffee. I have to say, without fail, every morning when I wake up, I am excited to drink their coffee because it is fantastic. Methodical's packaging, their website, the entire experience, it's just beautifully designed. Craft a cup that you'll love with Methodical Coffee by visiting methodicalcoffee.com and use our discount code Design Better to get 10% off your first order of coffee or tea. That's methodicalcoffee.com. I've got two young kids who can be a little bit on the noisy side, so my wife and I have gotten used to using closed captions on those rare occasions when we get a chance to sit down and watch a show together. Lots of us have experienced the benefits of products that were initially designed for people with disabilities, from closed captions to dark mode on your phone or laptop to voice-to-text to electric toothbrushes. Designing products for all people, regardless of abilities, leads to greater adaptability, usability, customization, and personalization. With 1 billion people worldwide living with disabilities, Fable Engage helps UX teams collect feedback from people with disabilities to help you build more accessible products. Fable Upskill provides custom accessibility training for digital teams to gain skills to build inclusive products. The best digital teams like Shopify, Microsoft, and Spotify partner with Fable to make better products for everyone. We're big fans of Fable, and we know you will be too. Learn more by requesting a demo at www.makeitfable.com slash design better. That's www.makeitfable.com slash design better. People like us who work in tech, we have to learn new things all the time and we have to do it quickly. There's no better way to get up to speed on a new skill than by picking up one of a book apart's brief practical guides for folks who design, write, and code. A Book Apart titles are perfectly packaged into around 150 pages. They're focused on topics that are practical, ranging from better onboarding, content strategy and accessibility, to SEO, JavaScript, and CSS grid layout. You can even pick up my book, Designing for Emotion from A Book Apart, and dozens of others from abookapart.com or wherever you love to buy books. And right now, Design Better listeners can save 25% off at abookapart.com with the code BETTER. Offer expires September 1st, 2023. And now, back to the show. In the first chapter of your book, you talk about something called narrative therapy and and finding your narrative. And there's an interesting story there about a psychologist, Stephen Madigan, who has a patient that uh, was in a very bad accident, was in a coma, and comes out just feeling totally disempowered and depressed. And Stephen helped him essentially find a better narrative through having friends and relatives write him letters about, you know, their feelings for him and how important he was in their lives. I'm curious how you think about translating that to a leader who wants to find their own narrative. Yeah, that is, it's a great question. And so what we learned from that one case study is that narratives are something that yes, you can tell stories to other people. And yes, you can even bake narrative arcs and architecture into the products you build and then check for stories with your customers and learn stories from them. Stories 
go much, much, much deeper. As humans, we also tell ourselves stories about who we are, all the things I just mentioned about who we are, where we're going, with whom, how, why, why not, how not. All of those things are stories as well. And our ability to see and understand and tell ourselves stories is so powerful that in in that case study, Madigan's case study, this person was convinced that he was a a failure and he didn't want to live anymore. And so we do have the power to write our own narratives and take control of our narratives in our lives in, in that way. When I first read that case study, to me, it sounded so familiar because on the one hand, so now my entire business focus is leadership development, executive coaching, team coaching, and developing leaders. And what you find a lot when working with individuals and with teams is there's a lot of stories that we tell ourselves that are or are not true. I hear this all the time, like, oh, that team will never go for it. Or, you know, she's not committed to her job. And those are all stories. Half the time, they're most of the time, they're actually not true, but they hold us back from doing our best work. So narrative plays into our daily work lives in simple ways where you can just check your stories and say, is this true? And then find out what really is true. Oh, she's not dedicated to her job. No, what's true? Oh, she showed up to the meeting late and she showed up to the last five meetings late. That's true okay, well, that's a mystery. Then go find out what happened. And (laughs) it doesn't mean anything. So sometimes narratives are super simple to figure out. And you just do that by asking people or checking your data, checking your stories. And sometimes stories are more complex. You know, I work with a lot of CEOs, for example, who when they come to me, they'll say that they're too loud and everyone tells them to stop <laughs> stop talking so much and start listening. And they're struggling to do that. I've worked with CEOs and senior leaders who have the exact opposite problem. I'm too quiet and everyone says I'm not talking enough and it's offending people and it's holding them back that way. What do I do? There are simple ways to deconstruct your narratives and find the true stories. And there are other ways that for me as a product person and as someone with a long tenure in the tech industry are also second nature, which is, we use the term, get out of the building. So this is like, get out of your head or get out of your team's head, get out of the building. Sometimes to find what the real story is about who you are as a leader and the impact you are making and can make is just ask people. You know, I imagine most people listening to this know how to do it. You talk to five to eight customers (laughs) or you have someone do it on your behalf. I do this for my clients and with my clients all the time. Get out, talk to five to eight from a certain segment, find out from their words Like, what are their dreams? What are their goals? How do they engage with you? How do they see value in working with you? What's amazing about the work you do together? What could be even better? And when you go out, talk to people, then you come back, put together the themes. You can use Post-its if you want. (laughs) You can use spreadsheets. You can do whatever. You find out, oh, this is who I am. Or if it's a team, ah, this is... This is who we are. This is the value people get in working with us. And these are the gaps and opportunities we have to propel our business forward even further. That's kind of a a long answer, but you know, I always think about the design and product development process in terms of how we lead ourselves through the business world. It's the same thing. You can do short little prototypes and tests. You can do big D discovery and get out of the building and you can iterate and mix and match. The key is that you use real data and you're not just making stuff up all the time. Donna, what do we do when our personal narrative with respect to our career and our capabilities is going in a direction that doesn't feel good? You know, we've had setbacks or failures. You know, a lot of people these days have been let go from their job and there's an unexpected twist in, in the personal narrative that starts to reshape our identity of like, 
I'm someone who's not worth keeping around, or I'm someone who's not a valuable part of the team. Extrapolate that out to any other circumstance. How do we reshape that narrative to go in a positive direction? I think it's the same thing. But first, what I will say is that the most successful people I've worked with, believe it or not, would tell you similar stories. Like I've worked with, I'll give you an example, CEO of a billion dollar company who told me something similar when you know we started working together. <laughs> oh, I should not be the CEO of my company. I'm not qualified to do this job. They gave me hundreds of millions of dollars by accident. <laughs> it's um, it, it's quite amazing what we tell ourselves. Oh, that new fancy pants Silicon Valley executive I hired, she hates me. I know it. None of this was true. I've worked with, you know, middle managers at large tech companies, same stories. I've worked with founders of tiny five-person companies, same stories. All of us have the ability to make meaning out of what happens in our life. It's not always the right meaning, but it's just what we do as humans. And so one, the first step is always to pat yourself on the back for being a storytelling creature and being a really wonderful human. Because that ability, and I go into this in depth in the book, that ability to tell stories and make stories out of everything we experience is one of the coolest features, evolutionary features of being human. It's protected us. It's saved us. It helps us in the olden days and paleolithic times when a lion was jumping out to attack us, it would get us to think, oh no, that's dangerous. Run. Like it's a good thing. But they also have the the ability to paralyze us and and hold us back just when we need to be doing the opposite. And so I don't want to say reframe that story because when I think about that, I think of, I don't know if you remember Saturday Night Live in the 90s, Stuart Smalley, and he'd be like, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and (laughs) gosh darn it, people like me. Like That doesn't work either. You're just going to fight yourself and you'll, you'll lose. That's just silliness. So first thing is really just you know, understand that you're doing what you need to do by feeling crappy and that's okay. When you've recovered a little bit, the best thing I would say is to fill in the pieces. So start collecting new data, new data points and new stories that will either substantiate that narrative you're telling yourself, like you're worthless. Well, maybe you are. I don't think you are, but it's good to know. So you find data points and narratives by talking to people. And in another way, I talk about this a lot in the book, you can also go through your past and think about all the things that you have loved doing in your life and all the times that you have made an impact. So those are data points too. You can go out and talk to everyone you've worked with, talk to your friends, family, find out how they experience working with you. And once you do enough of that, you start constructing new stories or maybe you validate some existing stories and you get more clear. I can't tell you what to do after that. I mean, this is where it's like, you know, design or product challenge. Like once you have enough data, you tend to get insights on what to do next. That's just about getting out there, get out of the building, get out. Just to pull apart what I think you're pointing to here and in your previous answer is you keep using the word data. This is like an empirical I learned a thing. I saw this. This is what was said. This was the actual event that happened. We could all agree that this is the data. And then there are the judgments, the judgments that people have about, you know, how that person behaved, how I behaved, how they perceive me as a leader, et cetera. So separating the data and the judgments is kind of key to what you're describing, I think. Is that right? Exactly. For yourself and for other people, it's so, so, so important because the stories we tell ourselves often just hold ourselves back. It's just us protecting ourselves. One way I like to think of it is, can you put a camera on it? You know, I'll use this example. When I finished an early draft of my book, I remember someone, I don't think she had read it, but she said some, a colleague made a comment like, oh, you're such a good writer. I'm sure it's great. 
And all I could think is, no, I'm not. I'm like, I'm like a terrible writer. <laughs> like, I hate writing. I, I cut half of seventh grade English. My grammar is terrible. I write in circles. I put my lead at the end of chapter. I, like, I'm a terrible writer and I hate writing. So she said that I didn't believe it, but also could I put a camera on that? No. <laughs> No. And so, you know, I remember thinking at the time, God, what she could have said is, hey, your writing really connects with me. Okay. Can you put a camera on that? No. But, you know, can she give me examples? Yes. Oh yeah. That one point in that one chapter when you said this, it gave me butterflies. You know, I've had comments like that from people and I'm like, okay, cool. I can't argue with that. And the same thing is, you know, when you're doing anything with yourself and especially in, in, in a work environment, dealing with giving people feedback, that's essential. Nothing is less productive than great job. Like it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't motivate anyone. It's the same as like, wow, that was terrible and not explaining why. So data is either can you put a camera on it or can you measure it? Like I consider physical reaction is something you can measure. It gave me butterflies. I've heard clients say that. I'm like, cool. <laughs> like, you know, I couldn't put a camera on it, but I saw you just had butterflies just now and got all fluttery. That's great. So yeah, can you measure it? That's data. It's like, it's truth. It's real things. I want to shift for a minute to uh, conflict and dealing with conflict. And you have a whole chapter in your book about this. And you talk about uh, this Google project, Project Aristotle, which we may have talked about in the show before, but if you haven't heard of it, Google, in very quantitative, googly fashion, did this massive study. They're trying to figure out what makes a high-performing teams. And somewhat to their surprise, they discovered that it was really down to psychological safety and feeling trusted that made the highest-performing teams. And I'm curious because I think that's often misunderstood or misrepresented. And I feel that you know, I spent a fair bit of time in academia. I think you have too, Donna. And there's this idea that, that I think originated in academia, which had, I think, very good intent. And it's this idea that we needed to create these safe spaces. And I think the unfortunate consequence of that is that it's turned into something where certain topics you can't talk about. Whereas I think if you're in a learning environment or if you're in a team where you've built that kind of trust, you should be able to talk about different positions, even take on a position that you completely disagree with and steel man it, and then have a discussion so that you're learning from somebody else who maybe believe something different than you, than you and, and then you're teaching people as well. So I'm curious within that, how do you think about building psychological safety as a leader within a team? I do think the term psychological safety has been misinterpreted by a lot of people as to coddle folks and to sort of buffer them from stuff. And, and then as a result, people don't always take it seriously. The model of psychological safety that I subscribe to, but that also has the biggest impact with my clients and their teams is the neuroscience model. So academic as well, but differently academic. The neuroscience model, the well-known version of this is the acronym SCARF. And the idea is that when certain, I constantly use the word trigger. I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to be more tame with my my language for other reasons, but I'm just gonna say it because it's a psychological term. When you are triggered in one of these areas, your brain cannot tell the difference between, oh, I'm in a boardroom versus oh, I'm in the jungle and a lion is about to attack me. Or I guess, I don't know if lions are in the jungle, but I'm in the savannah and, and a lion is about to attack me. Your brain jumps into overdrive and you do stupid things because when you don't feel safe, you might be able to run really fast or conserve the food you ate for, <laughs> for dinner the night before, but you're not able to think clearly in any other way. And you can't see big picture. Your, your eyesight literally narrows when this happens. The idea is that if you want yourself and people who you work with to perform at their best, not only to be aware of these triggers that set people into terrible work performance mode, but to optimize for these. Because when those basic human needs are met, people are thriving and things are amazing. And so the SCARF acronym, what it stands for, the triggers here are status, 
certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. And what you'll find is that when you have problems at work, either you're struggling with something and you're not at your best, or more likely people who work with you, whether you manage them or you collaborate and partner with them differently, when they're not at their best and when conflict is high and people are fighting and arguing and just things are really not good, the likely culprit is that one of those levers has been pressed. So either status is not what it needs to be. Oh, they were promoted. I wasn't promoted. It's not fair. It could just come down to fairness. That's a, a big one. People will live or die depending on if something's not fair. I mean, humans are that programmed to need these things. That's why you saw during COVID, people would li- die over wearing masks because it's not fair. You can't make me wear a mask. I mean, humans are intense about this. It could be certainty. I work with a lot of folks who love uncertainty. That's why they founded a company. That's why they do the wacky things they do. And yet people who work for them cannot function with uncertainty and they need more certainty and they all need to learn how one another works. And so we all have different needs. Like for me, a big one is autonomy, but certainty I need a lot less of, and that's okay. You can look at these anytime anything is going wrong in your interpersonal relationships at work, or even expand it farther. Like, hey, we're not doing well. We're not meeting our goals this quarter. What happened? And probably there are interpersonal conflicts that are at the core of what's happening. And reverse engineer it and figure out, all right, these are basic human needs. Every, and I'll bring the superhero metaphor back, every superhuman needs them. And how do we make sure that we're all doing what we need to do and thriving so our brains are functioning at their best? So that's how I see psychological safety. It's core to great superhero stories. It's core to effective leadership. And it's just what our brains need in order to not just function, but thrive. For those who have been maybe acting as a leader, even though they're still in an individual contributor role in their their organization, how do you know when it's time, like when you're ready to make a change to become a leader? And what skills might we need to develop? Yeah, I I see this a lot. First, I'm going to start with what not to do, which is if you love being an individual contributor and you feel like in order to be a real leader, I have to go become a manager because it's what I'm supposed to do, run. Don't do it. (laughs) You're going to hate it or try to find some little experiment to test it out. I see a lot of folks who go into management and executive leadership positions because they think they're supposed to do it, not because they want to do it. So that's one thing. And always check your shoulds. The flip side of that is, well, if you're on an individual contributor path and you love working with people, you love collaborating, you love nurturing, you love coaching your team members, you love empowering everyone you work with to do amazing work. You love providing a vision and then giving an open canvas and letting people play with it and figure out how to get there and then supporting them to go achieve the impossible. If those are things that really excite you, I would say if you're thinking management track, that's how you can really, really work on your leadership chops and work your way up your company, start your own company, and you can have such a huge impact that way. And so I think it's important a lot of, I mean, we all do this. A lot of people conflate management and leadership. You don't have to move into management to be a great leader, but if you want to be a great leader and you want to move into management, it will be amazing. If you love being an individual contributor and you still want to lead some way, you're, you're better off finding other ways if you don't want to be a people manager. It's a trap and it's <laughs> you're not going to like it. I think, you know, as with everything, you always want to really think about, all right, what do I love doing? When am I at my best? When have I been most effective? And how do I do more of that? Donna, as we get close to wrapping up here, first, I wanted to mention one book. You said you know, we were talking about kind of coddling and what's happening in, in university systems. And there's a really good book called The 
Coddling of the American Mind by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt it talks all about this. It's, it's an interesting read for people who are concerned about that. And, and Jonathan also talks a lot about the deleterious effects of social media on young people too. But in that vein, as we wrap up here, are there any books or television shows or podcasts that don't even have to be work-related that are really inspiring you right now? Oh, that's a, God, all these great, great questions. So it's been a fun week for TV. I just finished Succession mm-hmm. and uh, Ted Lasso last night. And so I would say if you're interested in leadership of any form, watch Succession for what not to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> watch the first, the, definitely the first season of Ted Lasso, especially if you're interested in team dynamics and building effective teams. The other two seasons I didn't find as applicable to the team dynamics and effective leadership in the workplace, but definitely the first season. Yeah. So those are, that's on my mind this week. Let's finish off by telling us where folks can find more about your books. You can always buy them wherever you buy your favorite books, especially The Leader's Journey. It's available anywhere. So if you want it at your favorite bookstore, just let them know and they'll get it in. You can also find them easily on my website, donnalishow.com. And I also have on my website free toolkits and tons of resources that you can download for free leadership tools and product development tools as well. So definitely find it all on my website, Leader's Journey. It's out now. People love it. And that's based on real data. I can say that. And (laughs) they found it very useful and applicable to their leadership. So go read it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Donna, for being on the show. We loved having you. Of course. Thanks, Eli and Aaron. This was awesome. Eli and I love producing this podcast, but sometimes we find ourselves wondering, What sort of feedback does our audience have? How could we improve the show? Maybe you could help us by taking just a couple minutes to complete a survey, answering a few questions about your thoughts about the show, sharing your feedback, and telling us a little bit about you. To take the survey, just go to dbtr.co slash survey. That's dbtr.co slash survey. Our thanks in advance for completing the survey. It'll really help us improve the show. This episode was produced by Eli Woolery and me, Aaron Walter, with engineering and production support from Brian Paik of Pacific Audio. If you found this episode useful, we hope that you'll leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to finer shows. Or simply drop a link to the show in your team Slack channel, designbetter.com slash podcast. It'll really help others discover the show.